The views on this program do not reflect those of ONTV or its board of directors. Welcome to OAA Now, your home for Oakland Activities Association news and information. Here's your host. Sammy Terramina. Welcome to OAA Now here. I'm Sammy Terramina, blogger around the OA, the host of Last Three Brain Cells, and the host of Between Terminus on Orient Able Television. I'd like to welcome those watching on the local voice on SoundCloud and those watching on YouTube. Today we got two guests here. Um, we got Scott Bernstein of MI Prep Zone here, and also Tyler Kept of CTV up in West Bloomfield. Guys, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being having us. Um, you guys were both at Media Day on Friday, and we know. What happened? I mean, like, were there any teams that impressed you at all during media day? You know, anybody that, um, you know, that um, made headwaves that you were interested in listening to? Tyler, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to start? Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Uh, I would say that Ferndale, Seaholm, Avondale were uh, three teams that uh, I knew a little bit about, but I learned more about and, and you know, I'll, I'll give a shout out to my host here, Sammy. You know, he, he's my, uh, sometimes, you know, I, uh, I pick his brain and, uh, he gave me some, uh, some, some guys to look for. And outside of that, you know, the marquee names, the West Bloomfields, the Clarkstons, the Lake Orions, South Lake and T obviously this year, uh, Groves, but yeah, uh, looking down at the, at the blue and the gold, uh, I, I was I was impressed by what I saw with those guys. Mm-hmm. Tyler, yeah, for me, I'm I'm I was I was impressed also with Avondale and and a couple of conversations too the uh, um with you know guys that from Harper Woods and and Seaholm North Farmington was another team that I, I think really impressed me with the conversations I had with them and you know things that similar to you Scott conversations I've had also with Sammy to get more insight into those teams. And then you know, from my OAA Red Division, along with West Bloomfield, you know, Lake Orion's a team that was already very impressive to me coming into the season, already very high on Lake Orion's team. And not just because this is a podcast you know, for Lake Orion and, and from Lake Orion, but you know, just because of that roster they have and having a chance to talk to a couple of guys like Billy Roberson and get more insight into that team uh, for this particular season, uh, those were particularly impressive teams from Friday. Um, let's break down. Are you guys ready to break down all, all four divisions here, guys? Um, yep. let's sure. break down, let's break down the gold division. Um, obviously when you look at the coaches poll, um, they got Ferndale favored, Avondale projected finish second, Berkeley projected finish third, Royal Oak fourth, Pontiac fifth. So let's break down each team, what you guys are looking at. We're going to start with Pontiac. Obviously when you look at the Phoenix under new coach, Wendell Jefferson, um, you look at Pontiac five and ninety one since two thousand eleven. I mean, it's hard to swallow if you're if you're someone that you know really values Oakland County, you know, uh, prep sports tradition and whatnot to see what's happened to the athletic department uh, and the school district in Pontiac. Uh, it, you know, it used to be such a you know a, a, a hordes of riches coming, you know, ath- athletes and not just. Basketball. I mean, people think of basketball or as Pontiac as a as a basketball mecca. But they had some really good football teams over the years, not that long ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, now it's just uh, it, it's. I, I hope Coach Jefferson can get this thing moving in the right direction. You know, he's uh, a, a former semi pro coach and uh, from Pontiac, and uh, you know they have they have a a nice centerpiece there and Kanye Donaldson. I mean, I've been aware of him since he was a freshman. He's the quarterback. For Me too. And he's really good. And he gets lost, you know, in terms of getting hyped up because of it's just, and it's nobody's fault. It's just the resources, the numbers. It's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough road to plow. If you're, if you're ahead of that program, mm-hmm. and the situation that you're in too. Yeah. The situation that you're in too, with the landscape of high school football today, with school of choice playing a huge factor in that too. And you know, the, the, the uncontrollable side of that is what's been going on in the Pontiac school district and with many other school districts economically over the last decade or so. And, and that's certainly affected the athletic department, but then you also bring in 
these schools nearby that have school of choice availability and are you know attracting a lot of these players out of a tough situation in Pontiac into their schools where they have contending programs there and they have a lot of eyes on them and look these guys want to play football they want to have fun it's a game that they love and they have you know limited time to play it everyone's football career comes to an end at one point or another but you can't blame guys for looking at the next level too. And so, you know, having Wendell Jefferson come in there, having Kanye Donaldson, a, a, a quarterback there that's already been impressive and it's only going to get more impressive with more time. Those are great building blocks. And I think that the sky is looking a little clearer coming into 2023 than it has in the past several years with Pontiac. Do you see Pontiac snapping the streak this year? I mean, I'm looking at their schedule, and I can see two games that look winnable for Pontiac. Um, I'm looking at that Week 2 game against um, Detroit Lincoln King Academy, and I'm also looking at that maybe, 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 maybe that Week 9 game against Garden City, um, where I think those are per- two perfect areas for Pontiac to get out the snag, get out the snap that streak, you know, because that's 42 games. It's just, that's too much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and who knows what, you know, uh, league play, maybe they can beat Royal Oak, possibly. That's our next thing we're talking about, yeah. Royal Oak. Um, That's another program that I would like to see take some, you know, leaps and bounds. It's it's hard. When I, I, I was growing up, you know, Kimball was such a power in, in, in a multitude of sports, uh, baseball, football, basketball. Uh, at least they were incredibly competitive, if not a power. Mm-hmm. Uh, they definitely were a power in football. Yes. Um, and just since it, since the school merger, they've been a non-entity. So they're twenty nine and one hundred five since one oh since two thousand eight. Yeah. Six and twenty eight since two thousand eighteen. This is Cam, Colin Campbell's going to be the third coach in um three years. Three years. Yeah. And when he was the interim coach. Royal Oak was outscored 125 to nothing in, their, in those three games. Yeah. And I'm going like, that's scary. That's, that's... I tend to look at classes, too. I look at you know, this from the angle of in the last three years or so, that's typically where you're going to get a decent mixture of players that are out the door and players that have been in this program and can see some direction forward are going to be part of that plan going forward. And for Royal Oak, you look at just these last three seasons – Four and twenty-one, one and eight last year, two and seven the year before that, one and six the year before that. They are in a really rough spot. But like you said, Sammy, they got some potentially winnable games on that schedule. The the gold division. Oh, the half, their non conference is brutal. I mean, they have Holly Week One, and that's against Billy Keenis in the in the in the day Tooley. That's going to be brutal. They still got. I mean, their last their three games last year. The teams that are rematching, they were outscored by Troy, um, Holly, and Madison Lamp- Heights Lampier by a combined 132 to nothing. That's not good. Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, Tyler, there. <laughs> no, no, that, that's it's a, it's a fair point. I'm looking at the schedule, and you know, the, the one that I kind of look at as being that potential ray of light at the end of the tunnel is – uh, is that week four game, week five game against Pontiac. And just like you said, with the Pontiac schedule, looking at theirs and those potentially, you know, three winnable games there, you mentioned King, you mentioned Royal Oak, you mentioned Garden City. Now that that's a point on September 15th, a very similar point for Royal Oak. If they're going to pick up a win, that could be a quality win against the team in their division. It's Pontiac on September 15th. Well, and then also when you look at Royal Oak, I mean, obviously they're, their quarterback situation's a mess. They got a solid running game. Um, and I asked myself this, do they need to change the culture over there at Royal Oak? Do they need to change the culture? They got to change something over there. Yeah, I don't know what the the uh, remedy to this problem is. It, part of it, again, just like with Pontiac, part of it is just numbers. Uh, it, it's a whole different, uh, you know, the, the people that live, and grow up in Royal Oak now are totally different than the people that were 30, 40, 50 years ago that were going to Kimball and Dondero. Mm-hmm. It's just a different, it's a different uh, uh, makeup of, mm-hmm. of, uh, of the community. Mm-hmm. And it, it doesn't seem like this particular makeup of the community puts a ton of value uh, on 
you know, Royal, Royal Oak athletic. And, and I know, I, I'm sorry that I keep on, you know, flashing back to, to my younger years, mm-hmm. but I know back in the eighties and nineties that, that, that community mm-hmm. did put a lot of value mm-hmm. into, uh, you know, Kimball's, uh, you know, being successful on the football field, the baseball field, the, the basketball court, mm-hmm. and same with uh, Don Darrow at a certain points. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if there's the impetus from within to make Royal Oak what I think it could be. We'll see how it goes with them. Um, let's go with Berkeley. I mean, obviously, when you look at the Bears, um, two years ago this team was twelve and six. Last two years. Last year, kind of that me over we kind of took over that program. They went two and seven. Um, I know Berkeley's got a very good quarterback in Sonny Cabbage coming back. Um, what is your initial thoughts on the Bears? I mean, they're making some changes. They're going back to the old school uniforms. They're going to the blue top white pants look. Yeah, I, I mean, I like the uh, I like the aesthetic. Um, I, mean, I like the way the, the mm-hmm. I like the way the, the uniforms look. Um, I think, you know, Sonny's a, a, a playmaker at quarterback. Uh, he can run it. He can pass it. Um, he's a leader. Mm-hmm. So, you know, hopefully, uh, I believe he's a senior, right? Yeah, he's a senior this so year. So I believe, you know, for senior year, uh, I think he'll uh, he'll rally the troops and, and uh, uh, circle the horses. And, and I, I hope that this will, this will be a, a, a team that's over 500. Mm-hmm. What about you, Tyler? Yeah, this is a team that you can be kind of hopeful with also given the given the leadership on that squad, having a quarterback that is a locker room leader and the emphasis that Coach Horn, uh, sorry, uh, not Coach Horn, uh, Coach Shields had mentioned both at Media Day and, and even in the media packet, working on the small things, getting that right, being in the weight room, getting up to the competition and, you know, starting off the season strong against a team uh, like Walt well, Dyke like Central at home, strong start to the season. You got, you know, four consecutive home games to open your season to get things right. And it's not going to be easy, but that first game's winnable. You can be competitive potentially against a team maybe like Athens in week two, and then get some learning experience against teams that are at that next level as you get toward the middle of that schedule, maybe make a run with a couple wins between Pontiac and, and Royal Oak later on in the season. So there's some hope there, but a very similar situation for Berkeley that we've seen in some cases too at the bottom of the Colts. I agree there. Um, let's talk Avondale. Obviously, of course, um, Coach Bob Meyer taking over that program. That's probably, in my opinion, sorry to interrupt you. Steve. I was yeah. going to say that's like such a game changer in my opinion. Bob Meyer bringing it in? Yeah, bringing Bob over to Avondale, I think uh, it's going to pay dividends very quickly. I mean, they were good last year. But can they get by the playoff hype? Can they get by that first round? That's the big question I have with you, Scott, yeah. is you look at Avondale, they've got the postseason, but they ran into a Birmingham Brother Rice. Yep. But they've ran in, you know what I mean? They've ran into a Nortonville Brandon. They could see Wall Lake Western if they get there. So that could be interesting, but you're right. He is a game changer. He brings a running attack to co- to help that dangerous passing attack they have with Tyler Herzog, Cooper Wolfrey, Justin Sykes. I mean, and he's got experience winning in the playoffs. Yes, uh, you know I I can remember that, again. This mm-hmm. could date me, but uh, back in the Tristan Jackson era at West Bloomfield, which was really the first the tip off to with uh, from from when West Bloomfield went from a. Uh, a, a a program that nobody talked about to a program that is a national recruiting power. It all started with Tristan Jackson. Mm-hmm. And I remember Tristan, it might've been his senior year and, and Bob's uh, Wall Lake central team went into the swamp and yep. took them out in the playoffs. I still can't believe that. Yeah. And that's when he had Nick crumb uh, who went on to play at Michigan state and, uh, Bob had some other great teams at Central. I can remember at Wall Lake Central. I remember the Zach Leinbach, KJ Schultz teams, and and Zach Leinbach is uh, coaching with with Bob in at Avondale now. And oh Zach boy. was the quarterback. Zach was the quarterback. They went to the regionals. I regionals, say. yeah. Yeah, and they so. lost the. Uh, they, I forgot who they lost to, but the game was at Ike. I think he might. Yeah, it was Ike, Eisenhower, Ike. Yeah, Ike. Yeah. But I love Tyler Herzog. I think he's going to be. Uh, Bob's going to add some stuff to, to, to his arsenal. 
Um, you mentioned Justin Greer Sykes. I, I, I think he's a really underrated wide receiver uh, in the OAA. And there's just a lot of weapons there for Bob to play with. And he's been at Clarenceville the last couple of years. I don't want to say that that's um, in some ways it's kind of like prep football Siberia. No disrespect to uh, – Clarenceville. I know at one point Clarenceville had some had some nice the last three years. I mean, like they were twenty five and fourteen. You know what I mean? And in, in four years. I just mean it, I mean in the sense of not not in the sense of what you can do there, but in the sense of people paying attention. Mm-hmm. I uh, mean, just like it's it, people don't at least now it's not mm-hmm. like there's a lot of people talking about Clarenceville football. Well, yeah. So uh, Bob, so Bob, I'm I'm happy that he's made the jump back into uh, maybe a little bit more re- uh, a little more relevance. Mm-hmm. Tyler, what about you? Yeah, I th- there's something about having great coaching that, at, particularly at the high school level, can be such a huge difference maker. And when you got a guy like Bob Meyer that, like you said, Sammy, 25 and 14 in recent years, and, and coming into a program that's in a competitive division and is in a competitive area of the state, that can be what puts you over the top. You go against these great programs like the Brother Rices, the St. Mary's, and and, and so on, you're going to have some problems because they have the recruiting base. They've got a great coaching staff. They've got the top facilities. And for a team that hasn't won a playoff game since 2013 when they beat Losser and then went on to lose to one of those Catholic schools, losing to St. Mary's, that difference making in in the head coaching and really in that coaching staff coupled with uh, a slug of returning players coming off a 6-3 and three season – there's a there's a lot to be excited about if you're an Avondale fan, and you know you could be potentially looking at winning the gold and having a nice season. And they have a a transfer I want to point out, Eric Kristoff from from De La Salle. Yeah, coming from a two time defending mm-hmm. state champion, and they'll slot him in there. Will be kind of plug and play. I expect him to you know hit the ground running. No no pun intended. Yeah, and I think that'll be interesting to see. Um, Avondale's toughest challenger in the division is going to be Ferndale. Yeah. Um, you know, I was really impressed with the coordinators he brought in. Mike DeVlo, um, the new offensive coordinator, used to be at Crosswell Lex, the head coach. They also brought in their defensive coordinator. Ferndale's got a lot of experience. they got a Bloomfield Hills transfer quarterback and Colin Hawk coming in there. So what is your guys' initial thoughts on the Eagles? Colin Hawk, to me, this guy just he oozes swagger. Um, he's never, uh, you know, taken a varsity snap yet. So we'll we'll see if that swagger that he seems to have when he walks into a room and seems to kind of command a room. I'm sure he can command a huddle. We'll see uh, if that translates, but uh, everything I've heard about him and, and talking to the coaches that have seen him throw the ball uh, this off season, uh, they're really impressed. And, and we should mention he was, he came from Bloomfield Hills, but he spent his freshman year at brother rice and he was the freshman quarterback at brother Rice, which is, yeah. Which Yikes. is which is not a uh, you know not every freshman and brother Rice gets a chance to quarterback that freshman team. That's uh, that's an honor, um, you know, un- unless you're like an Alex Malzone that's playing up as a, mm-hmm. a as a, a freshman on varsity. But uh, you know he uh, you know he he's been in some big programs. He's been coached by some big big people. Uh, coming over to uh, Coach Royal, uh, you know, he got tutelage from Coach K. Tulich from Dan Loria, and now he's going to have a chance to take all that knowledge and for the next two years hopefully become one of the, the better quarterbacks in, in the lower levels of the OAA. What about you, Tyler? You talk about having, yeah, and you talk about having that swagger, Scott, uh, having that locker room personality, someone that has been in successful programs that knows – what what a successful program does on a day-to-day basis, how they operate. And having that not come from the coaching level, but come from one of the players, one of your upperclassmen leaders on that team is huge in high school football. It's that secondary motivator that can be the difference between you winning a game, a game late and your team, you know, kind of floundering at the end when the chance is sitting there. So having that kind of personality and that kind of talent in your locker room, on your roster, can be a huge difference maker. I like LJ Neal uh, as a wide yes. receiver. Yes, he was originally a quarterback. I remember yeah. that. But then he moved to wide receiver. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, their defense. Uh, their defense is going to be nasty Really good. Year. They got good linebackers. Uh, you know, they're, they're good up front. And then the secondary is uh, really strong as well. Being the last team in Division Two last year kind of helps. So they got that postseason experience as yeah. well, so that does help as well. Um, 
Let's go now from the gold division, guys. Let's go to the blue. I mean, this I, is the blue could be the you know that 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 could be the the tightest race. Yes. Uh, that by the end of this by the it end could, of October. Yeah, I mean, like, and you look at the teams in this division. Obviously, um, the coaches they went Sea Home, Oak Park, North Farmington, Troy, and Athens. Um, you know, I mean, like, Emory can win this division. Yep. Um. I want to get your thoughts. We'll start with Troy Athens first. Obviously, um, the Vernon Burden effect, I call it over there. Of course, Vernon Burden, the new principal over there at Troy Athens. Um, he'll dip his toes in the waters of the football program. He'll, he'll uh, make sure that, you know, he can, you know, add some, some sage advice and counsel to how to get that thing moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing with Troy Athens, guys. 10-8 and eight last two years. How many will make the playoffs? Now, here's a stat here, and I've told this to Tyler earlier. Troy Athens' non-conference schedule this season is against teams that went 5-40 and 40 last year. So I'm going to have Tyler start this one off here. Tyler, what's your thoughts about the schedule for Troy Athens? Yeah, looking at, at Troy Athens' schedule, given that the blue is going to be, as Scott said, such a, a top-heavy competition, it can really go any of those three ways between Seahawks. Uh, Oak Park and North Farmington um, at that middle of their schedule they're playing North Farmington playing Seaholm then you get a little bit of a break so to speak with Pontiac and Royal Oak but come to the end of the season against Henry Ford you know that I, th- I think the bulk of that season in the middle is going to be the big test of where Troy Athens is and where they're going going forward. Coming off a five and four season, two and seven at the JV level, two and five at the freshman level. So they got some room to grow. Whether or not they become that middle of the road team or are at the bottom of the division, I really think depends on the performance of those teams at the top three in Seaholm, Oak Park, and North Farmington in no particular order. Mm hmm. Yeah, you see, um, you see it too. I, I, I think Athens can be very competitive this year. I mean, uh, you know, Tom came in last year and got him into the playoffs, and they didn't make the playoffs. Oh, they, they were over five hundred. Yeah, they were over five hundred. They make the playoffs, right? Five and four. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, they got they've got some veterans back, and you know, they're going to be you know they, they have a puncher's chance, and mm-hmm. that's all you can ask for. Speaking of this, here's a team that we've been talking about a little bit more, and that's the Colts of Troy. Um. Been in the playoffs the last few years. I know a lot of people have been criticizing Troy about not playing the big schools and all that. Um, this year, their conference get their non conference is going against teams that are eight and thirty seven. They got a very good player coming back in Jalen Peacock. They got Nolan Block. Um, what is your thoughts on Troy? Well, I'm going to start with Tyler first. Yeah, Troy is another one of those programs that's in a really interesting situation, Sammy B. And you and I talked about this a little bit before the show, too, given that, you know, as you said, 8 and 37 was the record last season for their, the, the teams in their non conference schedule. That could be a benefit to them in the rankings, but, you know, does that set them up both this year and in the future to really be competitive with the top echelon of, of that particular division or even outside of that division if they have? some aspirations for the future to move up in the OAA, given the size of that school. Now, this could be one of those teams that takes a jump over Athens, given the ease of their schedule. Do they make a jump over one of the top three? I, that That's more of a question of what Oak Park does this year, really, in my opinion, than, Troy, than uh, what Troy High School does. But what is promising about them is they're returning the majority of their starters on the defensive side. Six Not six serious. Starters. Yeah, but yeah, but you know they're returning six starters on the defensive side. They're coming off a, a decent season at seven and three. Their JV team was was five and three too. So you got winning talent that is going to be coming oh, up boy. in some respect. And with a lighter schedule, this could be a team that potentially job jumps into the 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 top three of the blue division. I don't particularly see that happening, but it wouldn't be something that. You know, drops my jaw at the end of the Tyler, season. the stats last year, you kind of look at last year, th- the points allowed. It's kind of a little bit skewed a little bit because they only allowed 44 points total, but against A&T, North Farmington, and Southfield, they allowed 109 points. That's brutal. Yeah. That's brutal. So they've got to start playing some of these Bigger echelon teams. Yeah, you know they want I mean? to advance. They have to. They, they got to get the to. challenge under them so they're not getting blown out when they're playing, you know, outside of 
the team's at either the bottom of their division or, as you said, you know, relatively light. And at some points, you know, including this season, if you look at last year's record for those teams, a feather light outside the, the division schedule. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Darius oh, Whiteside's gone. He yeah. Left, he went to college. Uh, yep. His Division one uh, wide receiver, uh, defensive back. What about Johnny Whiteside? Has he played? That's his brother. Yeah, I, I know he's playing. I, I know, I know, but does he play football? I, I thought he did. I don't know if he's playing or not. Okay, well, but I like Parker Brandenburg. Mm -hmm. um, I like their defense. Mm -hmm. um, Tom so, Callen does a nice job yeah, at defense. Say, yeah, Tommy does, a, does an amazing job, but just as good as a, a football coach as he's a softball coach. And, uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Oak Park, speaking of that, Oak Park, this is the team I we've been talking about. I have no idea. I have really, this, this is the has me scratching my head over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. Last year, they roll out an 0-9 team. Not Greg Carter-like. I, I, I was just absolutely shocked. Um, there's been a dip. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm stating the obvious. It, this, it, you know, you don't need to be uh, an ESPN uh, football analysis to uh, analyst to, to, to see this. It, there was a point not so long ago where the, uh, Coach Carter and the Knights roster was stacked with blue chips, mm -hmm. Division I uh, players up and down the roster. They've seemed to – cupboard's a little bare. You know, even the even the COVID year, where the, I don't think they won a game in the regular season, and then they made a run to the Final Four. Yep. But I, I don't know what to make of it. I, it's not Coach Carter. I mean, Coach Carter's no. one of the greatest coaches the, the state's ever seen. Um. I don't know if, if if these guys are going to A and T or they're going to the Catholic schools. Where, you know, where is the thoroughbreds that I've seen there all, all those years? Because mm -hmm. I, I don't. I look at the roster now, and I don't really see any guys that I, I look at outside of just seeing. That there's a there's a lot of athleticism there, and there's great coaching there. But I don't. Nothing pops out at me, and I'm like, okay, this is the guy you're gonna have to be worried about, or this is the guy on at, at this position group you're gonna have to be worried about if you're a defensive coach scheming for them. Mm -hmm. Tyler? And that's a great, that's a great point, Scott, because I ha I was kind of at the same spot with Oak Park, looking at them as they come into West Bloomfield schedule and looking through their schedule this year, looking at Oak Park's recent performances and looking back to last year and seeing, you know, seeing them not win a game is incredibly peculiar for that program. That's not something you're used to seeing. You're used to that really being flipped the other way. 0-9 last season, 3-6 and the year before that. Three and fifteen and last years. two years. Yeah, right. That's that's a really tough spot to be in. And then you, and even in the guide we got from the OAA at, at Media Day, when their coaching staff's putting down saying that you know the question marks entering the season are going to be your performance develop um, depending on the development of your younger team and your team depth. You're returning two starters on offense. You're returning four on defense. Your JV team also. Uh, failed to pick up a win last season. You know Greg Carter is a great coach. We we can talk about Greg Carter's coaching abilities ad nauseum to take the level of talent he's had and make something out of it in the past. That's evidence enough. So it really is going to be what kind of roster does he have? What kind of development has he been able to bring into this team over the, the last year? And, and are there strong points going to be enough to get over the hump against you know, unfortunately, some really tough competition within their division, you know, teams that are close to them in that middle of the road, like Troy High School, you know, teams that are down a division in the OAA, but will more than likely be competitive, like Avondale, and, and then, you know, even the, even the teams within their own division, Seaholm and in the red in Oxford and West Bloomfield, those are a lot of question marks right there. Those, you know, the, the winnable games on their schedule you're looking at, are ones that you're putting win, maybe a loss next to. So yeah. could this team be one that makes a big jump this year, surprises people, and takes the blue? Sure. Could they also be a team that has another fall from grace and ends up in you know the fourth or fifth position in the blue? Yes. It's a huge question mark. And you look at, obviously, we're going to talk about it. We got um, a couple more teams to talk about here in this division. Obviously, got North Farmington and Seaholm. Um, North Farmington, Ryan Shelby's back. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm calling my shot here. Okay. I've been high on Ryan Shelby since he got into high school. Yeah. Um, took a step back last year. I mean, Cause he, I think the ACL injury had a lot to do with it. Injury didn't look great when he came back from it. 
But I, I think Ryan Shelby will be the MIP of the entire OAA. I think he's going to have a huge year, and he's going to flourish as a senior. He's got the tutelage of M- Mill Coleman and John Heron. Coleman's and, gone. He's in. He went to Grand Rapids Catholic Central. All right. Well, I, I should have known that. Uh-huh. Mill Coleman left. Yeah, he's at Grand Rapids Catholic Central. He's the head coach. No, Coleman. No, his son transferred out to Grand Rapids Catholic Central. Oh, I did not know that. Yep. Well, thank you for filling me in on that. Yep. Uh, but he's got John Harrington. Uh, John Herstein. And, you know, obviously the head coach, Johnny Herstein. And, uh, well, even if he doesn't have Mill Coleman right now, he's been mentored by Mill Coleman the last two or three years. Uh-huh. And that should pay dividends. And uh, I think Ryan will be the, the engine for that team, the catalyst for that group. And then on the other side of the ball, Brendan Rice, one of the best uh, defensive linemen in, in, in Michigan right now. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, comes from a family of, of athletes, Aaron Rice. Yep. Uh, a couple years ago. Uh, just an, another great athlete. Yep. Uh, Tyler? Yeah, ro- rock solid coaching and experienced team coming back, having a difference maker like Ryan Shelby. And you know, this it's not going to be an easy schedule going up against the Groves and Sea Homes of, of the league going up against Caledonia. Caledonia. Yeah. Caledonia twelve and two team coming off of last 68. season. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a team yeah. that a team that shut out Clarkston, a team that kept still can't it believe relatively that. close with Belleville, a team that took out Rockford in overtime in the playoffs after after you know, running up Granville in the first round. That's not an easy matchup, but it's a, a matchup that you can be very competitive in on paper, coming back with the talent they have with seven starters on either side of the ball and that kind of coaching staff too. Coach Herstein having the tutelage of John Harrington and, and your assistant coaching staff guiding these players, knowing what it takes to beat those big teams. North Farmington's a team that could win that division easily and shock nobody in doing so. That is, I think it's a very good take, Scott, saying that North Farmington is going to be incredibly competitive, that Ryan Shelby is more than likely going to be uh, that short list of most improved players in the OAA overall. And, you know, this is a team that's going to be right there at the top of the blue. It's it's down or see home for me. Mm-hmm. And then speaking of see home, obviously. I'm high on a lot of their playmakers. Devere, the Candy Brothers, Devere, Robbins, Devere. Jim, Jim DeWald is, <laughs> you know, Jimmy is so underrated. I mean, yes. I, I would pick this guy to coach my team any day of the week. I would pick this guy to coach my son or my nephew any day of the week. He does it the right way. He He makes these guys – not just, you know, max out as football players. He maxes them out as young men, sending them on to uh, universities and, and, and the, into the real world. And he, he's just, uh, to me, so undervalued. And, and I always point this out, and I, I might be, you know, <laughs> being redundant because I think I've told the story a couple times. But His coaching job at Andover and Andover's last year, they didn't win a game. No. But it was one of the best coaching jobs I've ever seen. Every game, they were – this was a team that would have just been decimated by numbers. The, the school's about to shut down and merge. And, and DeWald had them – you know, every game was like 55-54. Um, and, and, yes, they didn't win, win a game, but it was the greatest 0-9 coaching uh, performance I'd ever seen. Uh, but he's done an amazing job coming over to see home. Keeping that tradition alive, uh, we, we talked uh, earlier in the show about, you know, I, I'm being kind of a little disappointed in, in the community at Royal Oak with not holding the the high school and, and its athletic program to the standards that, that I that I expect, but it's the opposite with Sea Home football. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the community are, are diehard Maples. Every Friday night, that the games at, at, at Maple Field, it's the, it's the whole town. It's not just the school. Um, everybody loves the Maples there, and and this is a team that has a multitude of big time playmakers. Yeah, uh, you know the quarterback Colton Kinney does a great job running that Veer offense. His brother Graydon, uh, you know, does does an amazing job on both sides of the ball. Uh, guys like Kyle Robbins, Sean Emerson, Jack Lewis. Uh, I, I'm just I'm real high on this group this year. Mm-hmm. Are you too, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, you win these games in the trenches, Sammy and, and Scott, and and the team that's returning 
uh, returning th- you know four key, three key players on their offensive line: Brick Baldwin, Luke Johnson, Luke Thurswell. They're returning you know similarly on their defensive line as well. Many of those players returning, and and like you said, Scott. You know, the, the coaching of Jim DeWall plays a huge role in this. And I, I'm a career Jim DeWall apologist because I'm an Andover alum and because <laughs> oh, I saw man. my brother being an Andover student in the years before me, just what that program had gone through. And having seen the, the games in that defeated season uh, at the end of the Jim DeWall era there, yeah, you can keep a team fighting when they have a losing record. When they haven't won a game, and every one of their games is, is a heartbreaker in some sense or another. They were another. averaging like 40 points. 40 points a they game. They were like an 0-9 team that averaged 40 points a right. game. <laughs> Right, and they're playing hard. They're yeah. playing hard. That's the best you can ask for. But even look at the last four seasons, eight and two a year ago. That is after having a one and eight season two years back, yeah. five and yeah. two before that. You lose. You have a losing season. That could be something that you no, know, that, that doesn't necessarily kill a program, but it kills the morale in that program, and that can affect you for years to come. They bounce right back like there's no difference yeah. there. So you know, if they're when they're winning, they consistently win. When they lose, it doesn't phase them. That's coaching. That's talent. Having a three-year starting quarterback, a three-year starting running back, an offensive and defensive line that's coming back, that's veteran, that is talented, that won eight games a year ago. If you're not high on Seaholm, you have you you gotta you gotta at least yeah <laughs> I've, I've got them ranked to the, see the way those guys play. I got them ranked to start the year, so you know, so well, we'll see what happens with Seaholm. What's going on? For let, let me ask a question. I'm I'm sorry. Does Granny Kenny play? Uh, linebacker as well. Yes, he does. Running back, linebacker. Um, All right, go ahead. Let's move. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go, to go the white. Yep, let's go to the white now. Um, when you look at this division, um, you got Southfield Arts and Tech project to finish first, Grove second, Rochester third, Harper Woods fourth, Bloomfield Hills fifth, and Farmington sixth. I'm interested. It's interesting. That I don't buy this at all. Yeah, I, I don't know how Rochester. I mean, maybe I'm overlooking Rochester. Uh, no, they they lost a lot of talent from last year. But I don't know how you're putting Rochester over Harper Woods. You're, you can't. Harper Woods got everybody back. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that's my... Harper Woods got everybody back. I mean, like... My first glance at the uh, the coach's poll was that was a little uh, backwards. And Farmington, Farmington should be higher, in my opinion, than both Rochester and Blueby Hills. Yeah. Um, so, what's your take on this division, guys? I mean, like, obviously, you know... Um, eight, it's just going to be a three-man race. Yeah, it's going to be... A&T, Grove, and Harper Woods. Mm-hmm. So, what's your guys' take on um? What's your guys' take on this division, Tyler? I'm gonna start with you. I mean, it's Southfield A and T at the top. The way that 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 team has the talent that that team has returning at the top, the caliber of that talent. Also, Zeke Marshall's returning. It's after senior heavy though this season. year, though. Yeah, but uh, look, this is a, a guy that, that threw for over 2,500 yards a, a season ago, ran for over 1,000 yards. He's got his weapons back. This team is upperclassman laden, coming off an 8-3 and three season, nine guys on defense returning. Southfield A&T is going to be a hell of a team this year. And, and you know, Sammy, you and I talked about that on Friday with the, a number of seniors coming back on their team. Look, in next year, the year after that, maybe some question marks, but this is a season that Southfield A&T could be one of the top contenders for Division One. That being yeah. said, looking at these rankings, I agree with you. I got some questions on, on this because I'm very high, like you are, Sammy, on, on Harper Woods. Mm-hmm. I love the job that Matt Odin's done there. They're returning the, they're returning the entirety of that offensive line, Stephon Buford played excellently last year. They've got weapons for him and, and Howells and an and, and Odin. They're returning the bulk of their defensive line, a couple of linebackers, uh, you know, three you know, three guys in the secondary. This is a team also that, you know, you look at their their non-conference schedule too. Stony Creek going up against them, you know, going up against uh, you know, um, Roseville at the end of the season. Stony Creek's the one I look at as kind of that more winnable game, but even when they go within their division or, or slightly outside, they can be competitive against a team like Clarkston in, in this particular year, given the way their defense was a year ago. Certainly against, you know, within the division, the Bloomfield Hills and the Rochesters of the world. And even with Southfield A&T, they're bringing back nine starters on offense and on defense and Harper Woods loaded with weapons too. That's going to be one hell of a game. Yes. When those two teams match up. I expect to be a high scoring, entertaining shootout over there down in Southfield this year between those two teams. I mean, yeah. Southfield's going to be the most off, you know, 
offensively explosive team in Oakland County, mm-hmm. uh, possibly in all Metro Detroit. Uh, they showed, you know, <laughs> they showed their fangs last year, and and uh, they're, they're just a machine. I mean, mm-hmm. they're an offensive machine with Isaiah Zeke Marshall uh, b- behind center. He's got maybe the best receiving core in the state. Uh, I'm sure there are other programs that would put their you know top three guys up, but I love Tashi Bra- or Tashi Bra- Tashi Tashi Bracefield. Tashi. Bra- Tashi Braceful, <laughs> sorry, Juwan Jarrett and Zavi Bowman, three Division One uh, caliber pass catchers. Juwan Jarrett is 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 such a Swiss Army knife. Uh, yes. Whether he's catching yeah. the ball, uh, going across the middle, whether he's running fly routes, whether he's taking back kicks and punts, uh, he led the uh, Oakland County last year in receiving touchdowns with fourteen, and is just a you know a speed merchant. Mm-hmm. Um, Davier Burt's a, a yep. under underrated, uh, you know, featured running back. They've got uh, Reggie Gardner yep. uh, anchoring line play in the secondary. Wendell Smith, who's going to uh, Eastern Michigan at, at cornerback. Jalen Todd, uh, you know, one of the best cornerbacks in the state, going to Kansas. Turned down a lot of Big Ten schools to go follow uh, his his quarterback Zeke Marshall uh, down to Lawrence. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm. I'm expecting big things uh, for Coach Marshall and his nephew Zeke and, and this group. The only thing I worry about a l- slightly is um, some of the size up front mm-hmm. isn't what it has been in the past. But I, I think the um, just the the pure you know s- s- size or just the pure spe- yeah. speed speed uh, uh, length uh, technique fundamentals will, will probably me- make up. Speaking of that, we have a talk Groves. I mean, like, obviously, um, Groves and Farmington. I mean, Groves and Farmington are two teams I'm really high on, especially with Farmington with Camp Petaway. And Groves went, well, just talking about Groves, they went, you know. Went to the state that, final last year. I was saying, they went to the final four last year kind of out of nowhere. Caden Hardy's a third-year quarterback. I like him a lot. Chris Little, another incredibly under-the-radar playmaker, wide receiver, defensive back. He led uh, Oakland County in um, – Picks. I think he had ten picks last yes, year. Yes, he did. Uh, and then Avery Gatch in the middle. Uh, you know, this guy's the a five star lineman. You know, could be the best overall prospect in Oakland County. Uh, just got an Oklahoma offer. He's got all the the power conferences coming after him. He's six five three hundred. Just a road grader. Someone that's going to protect the quarterback and, and and clear the path for for his running backs. Uh, I think Noah Sanders. Is mm-hmm. is their running back? I think so. And uh, you know, then Zach Rogers. You know, uh, he's Charles- going to corner this year. Yeah, they made him. They made him a move. Uh, uh, moved him from. Well, he's still going to play wide receiver, but he's going to. He committed to Toledo as a corner. He was okay. initially being offered uh, as a wide receiver when he when he first started to take offers in. And he's another guy that I expect a, a big senior year from. Obviously, the bloodline. You know, Charles Rogers is one of the greatest players ever to play in the. Ever wow. to play in the MHSAA. Ever to play at Michigan State. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, he had a, had a sad uh, uh, end to his football career in his life. But but Zach uh, is a guy that has all of the the positive attributes of his of his father's athletic pedigree, and and is gonna you know him and Chris Little just you know, people talk about the A and T secondary with with uh, Jalen Todd and Wendell Smith, but you know with with Rogers. And little with Groves, I mean, they're going to be able to shut down passing games along with Harper Woods as well. Yeah. Um, Tyler, yeah. what's your initial thoughts? Yeah, this is, a, this is a team that could be really impressive out of the white, maybe even be competitive with Southfield A&T just because of what you said, Scott, with the level of talent that they have on both sides of the football. The returning uh, m- multiple offensive linemen, including Avery Gack, on on the offensive side of the ball, that secondary is going to be locked down between Rodgers and Little, and you know they're going to need all of that to be playing at a high level, given the schedule that they have. Early season matchups with North Farmington and West Bloomfield, going up against Southfield A and T in the middle of the season, at the end of the season, you know, taking on Birmingham Seaholm. There are a lot of these games. And they got Harper Woods too. Say, yeah, Harper Woods too. There's a lot of these games that you can put down. I'm just looking at my. Uh, uh, my copy of their schedule, you know, I got four or five games that I have next to them as win slash loss. It's a toss up in a lot of these games. And, you know, that comes down to coaching. It comes down to the senior leadership. It comes down to how hard they're playing and what they do to answer 
that nine and four season a year ago, get, getting extremely far in the playoff, getting to the final four, losing to a team like De La Salle, and knowing what they need to do to elevate coming in this year under Brendan Flaherty. At, this is a team that is going to be incredibly competitive. It's them and Southfield A&T's race. Harper uh, Woods? In, uh, sorry, with Harper Woods in, in the white. And you know that's going to be a division that's going to have a lot of implications in uh, across divisions in the state of Michigan. I mean, any spoilers? I mean, obviously, I think I see Farmington for sure being the spoiler in this division. I mean, like, Bloopy Hills, they're going like, to be. I mean, I like Petaway. I don't know. Do they have other? They got some others. You know what I mean? Guys. I like what Coach Jason Albright's team has. I like They have a lot coming back. They just got to address the quarterback situation there. Bloomfield Hills, obviously, they got they got some places to replace. I like Kieran Crossley over there. Um, he's going to play everywhere for them. Rochester, we don't know about their um their um skill players yet. I mean, like for Harper, for Harper Woods, I want everyone to uh, look for Willie Powell. Yeah, uh, their linebacker, just a uh, um a menace sideline to sideline. Just committed to Air Force, six two two hundred. Uh, one of the fastest sideline to sideline linebackers you'll you'll find. And just has a real high football IQ, so he'll he'll captain that defense. Watch out for um. Also watch out with Harper Woods. Um, Odin's nephew Dakota Garant. I mean, yeah. like a freshman. Um, a lot of people he's been getting a lot of looks for them. Watch out for him. And then just what I want to just before we move on to the red, I, I can't heap praise on the Birmingham football elite without shouting out Brendan Flaherty. I, I we we talked about Jim Dewald and we shined him up nice and it was incredibly well deserved. But Brendan Flaherty. Pound for pound, one of the best coaches in the entire state of Michigan. Every year, this team is a threat to go to the Final Four. Every year, this team's got top tier uh, college recruits. Um, he does such a just like Coach Dewall does such an amazing job preparing these guys for for Friday Night Lights, and then preparing these guys to to go out into the world and be great human beings and great professionals. And um, he's been there for going on now 20 years and, and just if you're if you're the athletic director uh, uh tom flynn over at groves i'm just think i'm thinking my lucky stars every day i got Brendan Flair. Mm-hmm. all right let's go to the red now let's this is going to be the most unique interesting division um obviously then with the coaches poll you got west bluefield projected finish first clarkson second lake orient third adams fourth stony creek fifth oxford six now I don't agree with this poll at times. I mean, like, obviously, um, you know, obviously you look at last year with Adams and Clarkson, they lost a lot of talent a year ago. Now, yes, I know you look at the stats and all that, but but what is your initial thoughts when you look at the coaches poll of the Red Division? Scott, I'm going to start with you. I mean, I'm okay with the top three. I mean, I think it's going to be a, a three-team race between West Bloomfield, Clarkson, and Lake Orion. Um, I don't trust Clarkson on that one bit. You don't like Clarkson at two? Not, no. Having to replace uh, Clark? Have to place Clark. You Dillinger. have to place quarterback. You have to place Dillinger. Your defense, they got some, yes, they got Steppens and Cozen, but their defense was absolutely. Yeah, their defense was a little bit shredded last year. It was year. shredded last year. I mean, like, there were four games, three yeah. games, they allowed yeah. over 40 points. Yeah. I mean, like, so, and they opened up week one with Northville. That's brutal. I right. mean, Northville. Nick, Nick Wachenko uh, uh, is one of the best linebackers in, mm-hmm. in the OAA. I think he'll, um, you know, be an equalizer. Mm-hmm. And at quarterback, you know, Johnny Call, um, from what I can understand, is going to be the starting quarterback there. Okay. Um, and he's also a really good basketball player. Yeah, I know that. And, you know, I think John um, had a chance to win the job last year. Mm-hmm. And he'll, he'll be a junior. He'll have two years as a start, right. starting quarterback for, for, for Clarks. And I think he'll have a, uh, a big year and make a name for himself as one of the better quarterbacks in the OA. So I think that's a – a difference maker as well for Clarkson. But I am a little bit worried, like you said, about uh, losing a, a, a four or five star Cole Dellinger up front, losing Ethan Clark, who was the, you know, Oakland County's rushing king, which was really the, yep. That was the, the he was the only reason why he was the straw. He, that started, an outing right, game. He, he, was, he was the straw that stirred the drink all last year. Yep. So it, I would, here's what I would agree with you. I wouldn't put Clarkson at two. No, I'd put Lake Orion at two on yes. West Bloomfield. Tyler, yeah. you agree with me there, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally agree on, on that. And for Clarkston, my concerns are those big losses, a four-year start of your all-time leading rusher in Ethan Clark. But even more so, I think the Dellinger loss, the overall loss of that offensive line becoming so much younger, 
this year, that is really tough to over, that that's a really tough hurdle to get over for a team replacing that offensive line with talent on your roster and being able to not only open up the offense for whomever is going to be taking those snaps and whomever is going to be running up the gut, but also preventing defenses from coming at you uh, with, with strength in their in their D line too. And you know, Sammy, you mentioned that that opening of their schedule, Northfield at Southfield versus Rochester Adams. That is a brutal way to start your season in tough environments against tough and talented teams. Then they're finishing off the season. Their last four weeks doesn't get any easier there. West Bloomfield on the road. So at home, Lake Orion at home, Harper Woods at home, and then you're going on the road to Ike at playoff time. Uh, you know, Clarkson's, gonna be a, Clarkson's not going to be a bad team. Number two in the red. I I think that's I think that's possible. I don't think that's what I would. What I would Lake Orion's Lake, w- Orion's, w- Lake Orion's West Bloomfield's. Yeah. You know, it it it's West Bloomfield's league to lose, and yeah. Lake Orion is the one team that I think can knock them off. No, mm-hmm. I love Lake Orion. I love the talent they're bringing back. They're bringing back they're three top, senior top bottom, offensive yeah. linemen. Yeah. Roberson is coming off a season where he averaged 126 yeah. and a half yeah. yards Best running per, back in the league. Game, yeah. seven and, over seven and a half yards per carry, and he's got that O-line there. That's that's going to be really tough for, for teams to handle, and having a guy like Caden DeGraff and Reed on the defensive side of the ball, Trey Pekmara on the defensive side of the ball, a you know, somewhat favorable schedule that gives you some separation between super tough competition and quality competition. Lake Orion, I am super high on the Dragons this year. When you look at Lake Orion's schedule, obviously you look at their schedule. Yes, the league is going to be tough and challenging, but the game at Salina, I think, could be is going to be the one that tests them when they go down to Washtenaw County yeah. to match up with C.J. Carr. I mean, that's Kaden, not... K, you know, K.D. DeGraff Marie's got, got his, uh, you know, that's a, a heavy, heavy duty assignment yep. um, mm-hmm. to, to to spy on CJ CJ Carr uh, <laughs> from from a linebacker spot. But you know, if, if there are any linebackers uh, that I trust to do that, and Caden DeGraffenry is at the top of the list. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I love that guy. He, he, his motor, his his gridiron IQ. He he has the closing power of a Big Ten linebacker, even though he's going to Howard, which is a you know subdivision uh, D one, but. Hayden DeGraff and Reed to me is is checks all the boxes you want in, in a, a college division one college linebacker. And when you look at the rest of the divisions, obvi- division obviously you got Adams with Brady Pre scoring there. Number uh, one tight end in America. They got some questions though. They gotta replace a lot of talent. Yeah, and they gotta replace their quarterback. Yeah, that's and not that's, be easy. And, and and they you know we all know they run the veer. Yep. Um but uh you know they got a nice running back and, yeah. and, and Mateo. Mateo, Humbert. yep, Mateo Humbert. So I, there, there was such a game-changing factor with um, the Pico brothers. I mean, Parker Pico was such an electrifying quarterback and, and someone that could do so much that it, it's, it's not going to be an easy time. It's no. not, you're not just replacing a quarterback. You're, you're replacing like a like a movement. It was like yep. a Parker Pico and, and, and his brother Tate Pico, Tate, you know, they were, they were like forces of nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they did so much with the, with the, the stuff that you can see. And then the intangibles, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's a tough ask to replace that. But I, I don't think Adams is going to slip that much. I just don't expect them to be contending to go back to Ford field this year. Um, Tyler, same with you. Yeah, I got that sort of same same take there. You have a game-changing player like Parker Pico at, as your quarterback. Yeah, look, they're going to run the Veer offense. They're not going to go away from that. They're not going to have struggles running that offense under Tony Petrito. They've been doing that for over 20 years, and they haven't had an issue up to this point. But the thing about Parker Pico that I think put Adams over the edge in the last several years was they didn't have to rely necessarily on strictly the Veer offense. They could go into a more or today traditional option offense. They could have him be the primary ball handler. They could have him be a pocket quarterback with the weapons that he had, and he would make everything work. You could not stop this guy. He was otherworldly on the gridiron. Losing his brother Tate also is a big loss, and they're not returning a ton of uh, offensive or particularly defensive starters. What is 
What is something that you can give them here is that the performance of their JV program has also been strong. In the freshman season. was undefeated Six last year. year ago, nine and oh freshman team last year. They got some talent coming up that is clearly working in that system. That could be an early a difference maker for them as they're growing throughout the season. But I do think it's one of those transition years for Rochester Adams. They're not gone, but I don't really see them as being the powerhouse of the red in 2020. Look for Lachlan Tillotson to yep. probably take the quarterbacking job. Yep. If Petrito wouldn't, um, you know, commit to him. This is a three man. Yeah. It's, yeah. But that's I, what I'm hearing. Tommy offer and uh, Rhino waters. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I would put my money on Tillotson to take the yeah, I'm thinking that, too. Um, let's talk Oxford. Um, obviously, Coach Zach Line, I had him on the pod last week. Um, very high on Luke Johnson, the running back. Um, when you look at Oxford, they three, they have a quarterback competition coming up. Um, what is your guys' initial thoughts on Oxford and Stony Creek before we talk West Bluefield? I mean, any time that Zach Line's coaching them, I'm, I'm confident in his ability to coach talent up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just when they beat Clarkson a couple years ago in the playoffs, that – Told me how how uh, what a what a what a great in game coach Zach Line is. In addition to knowing that he he's a great motivator and he's got the NFL pedigree, uh, I, I like Jake Champagne, who's yep. a, who's a really good basketball player, wide Possibly, receiver. He's going to be a wide receiver. I think that it, you know, he'll he'll break out on the football field this year. Jake Cady mm-hmm. uh, is one of those you know Swiss Army knife guys. Both does, Cady brothers does everything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then Stony Creek, you know the the Merlos. You know, when you're talking about fundamentals and and playing the right way and every snap you're doing everything you can to get better and every snap you're doing everything you can to win a game. I I, I don't know how many wins they're going to have, but I know every game they're going to have a chance to win because of the, the armor up culture the there. Yeah. Yep, Tyler, what's your thoughts on both Oxford and Stony? Yeah, uh, Oxford's one of those teams that every single year. You're either underestimating them or you're just not thinking about them from the right angle. I contend, I consistently refer to them when I talk about West Bloomfield football, including on the broadcasts uh, that we do at Civic Center TV for these games. I refer to that Oxford game as the big blue trap game. Mm-hmm. Because at any given time, with the way that that team's coached, with the way that those players play for Zach Line. We talked about that with Jim DeWald, with Brendan Flaherty. We know from recent years, I can attest to that from West, the West Bloomfield side under Grice and under Bellamy. Those guys love their coach. That community loves their coach, and guys are going to play hard for them. And that's a team that could take a game away from an Oak Park, could take a game away maybe from you know, an Adams in an unbelievable week and you know, could maybe you know, put together a winning season that surprises people. They have, they're bringing back seven starters on either side of the ball. They have strong, strong leadership, both from the coaching level and from the playing level. You know, it's a tough division. Do I see that happening? I see their floor being a little bit, uh, I see their, their ceiling I can see not four being wins. all too high. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can get five wins. Mm-hmm. You can get four wins. And Stony Creek, you know, same thing with them. Yeah, so, sort of the same thing with them. Middle of the road team a year ago, but what really, uh, what really bodes well, I think, for them, uh, is, is their JV program having been seven and two a year ago, bringing some of those guys up and into the fold, you know, taking on uh, in their non-conference schedule a team like Anchor Bay that that struggled in 2023, went three and six, and, and looking at Stony Creek's schedule a year ago, the, the way they were able to stick around for part of that game with West Bloomfield early on in particular throughout that game with Lake Orion, a 14 to, to 24 loss and you know, a couple of close games at the end of the season against Anchor Bay, a one, one point win against Rochester in the playoffs, a one point loss. Stony Creek is an interesting team because mm-hmm. they're well coached. They're bringing back a bunch of key players. They have solid chemistry on that team and a, a schedule that could potentially be favorable to them. But again, they're just one of those teams that's stuck in a division that is so top heavy with West Bloomfield, with Lake Orion, with Clarkston, with Adams. It's going to be really tough to pick up wins. And then we have West Bloomfield. Obviously, when you look at the Lakers, um, Raekwon Nance back at quarterback. I'm really excited about Kari Jackson back at linebacker. Um, you know, co- and I love that they went with Zach Hilvers, the new head coach. So talk about what is when you. I'm going to start with Tyler here. Obviously. Um, 
because you do cover the Lakers. Um, what is your initial thoughts when you look at West Bloomfield early on? Uh, that defense should be in your nightmares. Uh, mm-hmm. In particular, the talent they have on that side of the ball, losing just three starters from a year ago. Brandon Davis swaying off an 18-sack season. Multiple Big Ten prospects in Kari Jackson and Jameer Benjamin. D1 after D1 after D1 players a year ago. Bringing back a healthy Rick Nance on the offensive side of the ball is going to be huge for them. And uh, Zach Hilber said it to Matt Catoni from our team on Friday. You can expect to also see Brandon Davis Swain lining up on the offensive side of the ball where he got 63 yards and a touchdown a season ago. My biggest question mark for West Bloomfield coming into this particular season is, is, there, is in the trenches on the line. Losing yep. Amir Herring is a massive loss. Yep. Losing the tandem of Dennis Irving and Craig Tillman and the guys filling in on the defense. What about the fact that Ryan there. Ross should be there? Ryan Ross? He's over yeah, at right. La Salle now, but he yeah. should be I mean he yeah. spent his first that was a major two, loss spent his first two ago. years at uh at West Mobile. Yeah, that was a major loss a year ago, even more major coming into this season, given the losses that you have. So yep. you know does that O line make the jump? Do those juniors coming up make the jump to be highly effective in their roles this season, enough to give Rick Nance a chance to make sound decisions. And then what steps forward does Rick Nance take from a poise standpoint? Sometimes in the past couple of years, it has seemed a little bit to me with my seeing eye test, a little bit of ants in, 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 the, in the pants sort of a deal with him on the, on the field. Certainly improved from his sophomore season into his junior season. I'm expecting a big leap especially given the way last season went for him wanting to have a strong senior year. But, uh, you know, that the offensive line, the defensive line going to be a question. But what you're off, if your offense isn't able to necessarily have you take over the games, the defense is going to be something that's going to keep you in the games for WB. And when you look at West Bloomfield, obviously, you know, the schedule, obviously they open up with Chippewa Valley. Um, you know, that's an interesting match going against Scott Merchant. I know a lot of people are circling that game week four at Lake Orion. Of course, yeah. I know the history there. I remember the game in 2019, oh, that awesome. four overtime crazy game. Two, it took two that. days to finish. Yeah, and I, and I still yeah. remember Coach Ron Bellamy saying he didn't want to see Kobe Manzo in his yeah. dreams again. I remember let's that. Try, let's, just one, uh, let's just give some love to Kobe. He had to, to hang, hang up the cleats this uh, mm-hmm. this week. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, let's wish him the best. and. What a what a playmaker he was! What a competitor! Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the best senior seasons that I've covered yep. in, in my fifteen years of, of coverage, and uh, a tremendous human being, tremendous young man, and w- wish he could have had a, a, a more fruitful college career. But you know, injuries play a role in, in in this kind of stuff, and he's calling it a day. And and just he has he has nothing to be ashamed of. Keep your head up high, man! You're one of the greatest greatest players to ever play at Lake Orion. And uh, you should be proud of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an all-time great in the OAA. And uh, I know, you, Sammy, you mentioned that four-overtime game you know, at, at Civic Center TV before the football season. Uh, and I, I do a lot of the programming over there, too, putting together you know, uh, past broadcasts and, and taking that one into a Laker football classic. It's not so much the four-overtime game. I could rename that easily the Kobe Manzo show. That yeah. was an amazing performance from him and, and, you know, Scott, you mentioned a legend at Lake Orion, a legend in the OAA in mm-hmm. Oakland County in his own right. So certainly you know, wishing him the best going forward as he, uh, as he puts a cap on his football mm-hmm. career. You know, and, you know, my analysis of West Bloomfield right now is, you know, kind of my same analysis I've had um, for the last decade that this, this program's got the talent every year to make a run to, to Ford field. We've only seen them there once and they, they won the state championship uh, twice. They were there. They lost. Oh, they to lost to West Bloom. Yeah. West yeah, Bloomfield lost to Clarkson. Yeah, Clarkson. sorry, the three two yeah. game. I apologize. Yeah, they've been there twice. Uh, won once, um, but this year, you know, taking aside the fact that I, I I do see some potential blind spots for them uh, or, or or weaknesses for them in the trenches, their skills position players um, can can. Set a set a football field on fire. Yes, uh, Rick Nance. You mentioned him. You know he he's a little bit of a over the last couple of years have been a little bit boomer bust. Mm-hmm. Either knocks your Uh-oh. knocks your socks off, uh, blows you away with with mm-hmm. uh, uh, a touchdown run or a touchdown pass or uh, eluding the 
the pass rush to, to get a pass off downfield, 3,000 combined yards last year. And um, he he's a guy that I agree with with Tyler. You know, I, I think he's, he spent this offseason – Tightening up his game a little bit and, and trying to remove a, a, some of the the erratic plays where he would get a little maybe too eager and try to force a play and that would cause turnovers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when he can you know uh, trim the fat in his game a little bit and, and make for a great senior year because I, I expect him to do that. And from talking to the coaches and, and seeing his his preparation on the off season, I know he's been putting a lot of work. Uh, in the in the mm-hmm. uh, watching yeah. videotape, yep. um, making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and you know he's he's locked and loaded for for a big senior year. I think he's going to be in the running for Mister Football. I think uh, so too, just because of the stats yeah. he's going to put up. Yeah, at running back, not a lot of people running are talking back. about Josh Tate, but I am very high on Josh Tate. I, think, I am too. I think by yes. the, this time next year, Josh Tate will be a blue chip. Running back having offers from Big Ten, SEC, Pac-12 type schools. I don't know Pac-12. A type Pac-12 type might not exist. exist. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's real, real low key right now. And I know him and his dad have been kind of asking people like, why, why am I not getting more offers? Why isn't there well, more attention coming my way? Well, I, I don't think you have to wait much longer. No, I think by Halloween this guy's going to be a household name. So look for Josh Tate, uh, Brody Peaker, uh, Pickers. Another great athlete, baseball player, football player. He's going to rush the ball. He might catch the ball a little bit out of the backfield. He might play a little safety, if not a lot of safety. Um, and then the receivers, just another star yeah. studded, another star studded receiving core for this L boys group. Uh, and these are guys that haven't yet become superstars. And I think you're going to see, just like with Josh Tate, you're going to see it this year. Cam Flowers uh, yep. and Elijah Trent, yep. Durham. Um, are guys that uh, I expect big years from. And then watch for a transfer from South a t Nigel Dunton, who was at West Bloomfield as a freshman, went to a t came back? Yeah, went for two years to yep, a t and now is back at West Interesting. Bloomfield. Look for him to be a, a big-time playmaker at both wide receiver and at safety. Um, and then, you know, Tyler mentioned it, Jameer Benjamin, yep. you know, for my money, the best locked-on cover corner in the yes. state of Michigan. Mm-hmm. He's going to UCLA. He's team with uh, Bryce uh, Rowe. They call Blaze. Yep. Blaze Rowe and, and Jameer Benjamin are going to be one knockout uh, tandem of cornerbacks. Brandon Davis Swain, you know, best pass rusher in, in the state right now. I, I think that not that this matters, but just to to um, some housekeeping. I, I think that when they put eighteen sacks for him in the in the press packet, I think they were talking about. His sophomore year, he had 18 sacks. I think so too. Last year, I think yeah. he had none. That, I mean, last year he still had a lot of sacks. Yeah, I think he had 13 or 14 last year. Mm-hmm. That's still. I mean, you're talking about 30 sacks in two years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm excited to see him line up more at, at tight end, like like Tyler said. Mm-hmm. I think that's gonna help stretch the field. So, yeah, you know, it'll be on the offensive side. It'll be very interesting to see how it goes this year, guys. Um. Obviously, that's all we have the time for today. I'm, Co- I'm Tyler Kepp, Scott Bernstein. Thank you for joining us this week here on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, of course, we're going to be done. yep. We're going to be off the um, we're going to be off the air for the preview shows coming up on um, for the next four weeks. So we're going to preview so we're going to preview those. So follow the blog at Saginaw Bay forty six fifty at blogspot.com for the latest information around the OAA. Um, keep an eye on the on the rankings this week. I will have the rankings up after the gold preview show. Um, so we will have the um. The previews and the rankings up heading into the season. Okay, everyone, I'm going to sign off here. Um, take care. God bless. And I will see you all next week, everybody. Take care and see you then. God bless all.